dealing with electricity in this book, which is called Dead Men's Secrets by Jonathan Gray. If you want a copy, you can get a copy, I'm sure. In fact, I know you can from bravenewbookstore.com. So if you're online, go to bravenewbookstore.com or Brave New Bookstore. Their phone number is 512-480-2503. I don't get paid for promoting them. The reason that I use them so much on the air is because uh, many of these books are hard to find. You know, People will call the law school and say, well, I can't find that book. I can't find that book. All right, well, now you can find it. That's where you go to get it. Um, I'm sure this is a book published in 2004. I'm sure you can get it at Barnes & Noble or Amazon or your local bookstore. All right, I so said we take a look at art, so I flip over here to page 239. This was quite a story on art. I didn't know this. But art, you can take a look at it and you can see how advanced people are. Imagine, and you may say, and perhaps I should agree, were it not for the consistent testimony of reputable witnesses, Well, a crystal skull during certain phases of the moon emits capella choir music, melodious tinkling bells, and a violet glow. Scientists have no theory at all to explain this phenomenon. The 11-pound skull was unearthed by Michael Hedges at Lubantan, British Honduras. Now, this is spelled L-U-B-A-A-N-T-U-N, Lubantan, British Honduras. It is no secret that prehistoric art and sculpture pose for us some tantalizing mysteries. We are confronted with three-dimensional art, four-dimensional art, visible then invisible, sex change sculpture, 18-story high statues, murals in luminous paint, carvings designed to produce a 15-minute moving picture, a sequence with the brilliance of a neon sign. Did, did you get that? Listen to this again. Here's what we have dug up in archaeological digs. Three-dimensional art. Four-dimensional art. Visible then invisible. Holograms, we call those today. Sex change sculpture. 18-story high statues. Murals in luminous paint. Did you get that one? Murals in luminous paint. Where in the hell do these people get luminous paint? Carvings designed to produce a 15-minute moving picture, a sequence with the brilliance of a neon sign. Now, such subtle techniques run counter to the common view of primitives living in caves, using clubs and crude flint tools, and looking like ape men. So far, I have not been fortunate enough to hear an explanation of such ultra-modern genius that is even tolerably convincing. Some of this art is so advanced, its techniques are ahead of our time today. In Altamara, Spain, uh, Lascaux, France, that's spelled L-A-S-C-A-U-X, I guess that's Lascaux, France, and then Riba, let's see if I can get this one, Riba de Silla, spelled R-I-B-A-D-A-S-E-L-L-A in the Sahara Desert. There are cave paintings of highly developed and stylized art, which look strangely modern, masterpieces in any period. Their dynamic realism and beauty, their flowing lines and contrast, their use of perspective, make them immensely superior to the later animal paintings of Egypt, Babylon, Greece, or Crete, and of a, or Crete, and of a level not again reached until the Renaissance in the 15th century. Sketches and trial pieces found suggest that there were art schools. The pictures show shadows and highlights. There is a plan of construction, an idea of composition that makes use of hollows and knobs in the rock. The painters possessed a culture much more advanced than the average inhabitant of the European countryside today. Now, Ajanta, spelled A-J-A-N-T-A, near Bombay, India, in the 6th century, Luminous paints, cave murals, portraying women carrying gifts, lack depth until the light is switched off. In darkness, the figures on the wall appear to be three-dimensional, as if they were made of marble, by the clever employment of luminous paint, the secret of which has been lost forever. Can't be duplicated today, at least nobody knows how. France. The engraved bones of Glazelle are still the finest in the world. Um, from Mohenjo-Daro, Pakistan, Mesopotamia, and the Persian Gulf, in case you want to check me out. 
This is uh, spelled M O H E N J O hyphen J, excuse me, D A R O, Pakistan. Soapstone seals carved with figures of bulls, elephants, antelope, and other animals. One showing a man up a tree with a tiger lurking hungrily below are only as big as postage stamps. So fine is the artwork that it might have been done under a magnifying glass. Here's miniature art. In Havia, Brazil, spelled H-A-V-E-A, Brazil, a mountain carved to resemble the head of a bearded man wearing a spiked helmet. On the side of the mountain, on a small vertical face, 3,000 feet in height is a carved inscription in cuneiform characters some 10 feet tall. It is a mystery as to how this was accomplished. In the plateau of Marchuasi, M-A-R-C-A-H-U-A-S-I in Peru, is a plateau called Mar Cahusi, Peru. Four-dimensional art. Carvings which, according to the angle of vision, have several faces, but you have to move into the right spot to distinguish each of them. As you move, they disappear or change into other figures. Many become visible, then invisible again, seen only at noon or twilight, or certain other hours, or at one of the solstices, and at no other time. A figure of an old man, when photographed, changes into the carved face of a radiant youth. Now, how can we explain this sculptural mystery, which is revealed only in the photograph? It is hard to see how an artist could achieve this effect, even with the benefits of modern science, without a photograph to work from. Now, think of that. I'm going to read that one to you again. There's a place down in Peru... There's a plateau there. You spell it M-A-R-C-A-H-U-A-S-I that has a four-dimensional artwork. This four-dimensional artwork is made up of carvings which, according to the angle of vision... Now, think about this. Here in modern times, we have what we call holograms. And when you turn the page... It gives you a different picture. So you can look at it in two dimension, three dimension, and the hologram makes four dimension. That's pretty modern. That's pretty modern. I didn't know about holograms when I was a kid. That's a technique that has been dis- discovered here in the last, I don't know, 25 years maybe. Maybe somebody invented it in 1936, but it certainly wasn't very common. I don't know when it came about. Now, here's a carving which, according to the angle of vision, has several faces. But you have to move into the right spot to distinguish each of them. So it's not just a hologram on a page. This is an artwork that is on the side of a mountain. As you move, they disappear or change into other figures. This is a huge hologram. Many become visible and then invisible again. Some are seen only at noon or at twilight or certain other hours or at one of the solstices and at no other time. This thing is designed so that the rays of the sun at the solstices, the light angle that comes onto the face of this, can only be seen during the solstice. A figure of an old man, when photographed, changes into the carved face of a radiant youth. So in order to get the the full dimension now of this piece of artwork, which is engraved on this, in rock, on this, this mountainside, you have to photograph it. And then look at the photograph to see the hologram change between what's on the mountain and what is hidden when you move it in different directions. I never heard of such a thing. And yet there it is. That isn't something that's been made by modern technology. That's something that that can't be duplicated today. So far from dragging their knuckles on the ground, whoever these people were, you know, back in the olden days, how old were these olden days? Is this something done before the flood and survived the flood on the side of the mountain? Or is it something that was carried through the flood and developed after Noah's departure from the ark and the antediluvian races, excuse me, the, the uh, survivors of the antediluvian races? See, I, I don't know the answer to that, and I'm not sure anybody else does. My thinking has always been that these things were done before the flood. This author here thinks that they were accomplished after the flood. All right, now the artist needed incomparable skill to make the shapes appear only from certain angles and under certain specific conditions of sunlight. 
These examples belong to a vast complex of monuments and sculptures covering a square mile using whole cliffs with images of the four main human races and of animals from other parts of the world. Animals that are not found in South America today or in Peru. Races of people that are not found in North and South America are depicted on these these carvings. And it covers a square mile of the cliffs. I mean, we're talking about something humongous here. Now, every type of, of uh, uh, sculptural technique was used. Bass relief, engraving, and play of light and shade. The sculptors scientifically utilized the laws of perspective and optics. Then there's Easter Island, South America, the Onega River in Russia, the Maya, Guatemalans, and in Australia. Now down in Australia, this is number 10. Remember the, 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 the picture that we get coming out of Australia, or the people that live there, are these Aborigines.